Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. We've got a new series entitled Gratitude today for the month of November, since we're in a season of Thanksgiving. So I want to begin this morning's message by celebrating and saying thank you to all of our veterans uh, this morning. Could you just please stand up for those of you who are vets here? There's a bunch of you, I'm sure. Yes, let's give them an applause. Awesome. Thank you guys for serving. Thank you for the freedom that I have. Amen. Amen. I love this country. So 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 18 says, in everything, say in everything, everything. not, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks for this is God's will concerning us. There's a story of a a famous poet and a writer from Britain. His name is Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling made um, a lot of money. Actually, he's he's famous for writing The Jungle Book. You guys ever ever read The Jungle Book or or, or saw the movie? It was my favorite movie when I was a kid. So he made a whole lot of money, um, you know, in his writings and, and doing poems and stuff. And a newspaper reporter came up to him one day and said, Mr. Kipling, I just read that somebody calculated all the money that you made from your writings, and it equals to $100 a word. And Mr. Kipling looked at it and says, man, I wasn't aware of that. And so this young uh, writer cynically, I mean, this reporter cynically reached into his pocket, he pulls out a $100 bill, and he gives it to him. He goes, here's a $100 bill. He goes, now, why don't you give me one of your $100 words? And so Mr. Kipling took the $100 bill and he's looking at it and he's looking at this reporter and then he just begins to fold it and puts it into his pocket and he says, thanks. <laughs> that was the word. Now that is a $100 word, but actually that word thanks is more like a million dollar word if we use it correctly in our lives, right? But that word thanks is a word that's too seldom heard and too rarely spoken and too often forgotten. And we're going to take a look at what gratitude um, looks like here in the context of the season that we're living in today. But 1 Thessalonians says, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, have you noticed that in that word gratitude, there's another word in there? And what is that? Attitude. Thank you for those of you who responded. Attitude. And so gratitude is more about your attitude than it is about your circumstance. It's more about an attitude. It's actually, when you look at it spiritually, it's actually a way that keeps you above the fray. It's actually walking in the spirit. If you really try to practice uh, thanksgiving and gratitude in your life, man, it's a challenge. It's a discipline that you and I have to, have to do. So the will of God, the scripture says that the will of God in Christ Jesus is to have gratitude in all the circumstances in our lives, all of them. It's a high standard, but it's a worthy, worthy goal. Now, when Paul writes this letter in th- to the Thessalonians, you have to understand that he was writing to a very young church, a young Christian church that was just established. And they were going through some major, major persecutions. Now, the persecutions they faced back then is unlike the you know, persecutions we face today. I mean, it's nothing what we face today compared to what they were going through in the back. So he had them. He goes, hey, go see if these young Christians, if they're doing okay in the middle of all this persecution. And so they went over there and they said, hey, Paul, everything's good. Man, they're, they're rejoicing. Their faith is strong. They're doing well, even in the middle of all this. Some of them were leaning here and there. So Paul begins to write a message of encouragement to them. And so he starts talking about, um, he, actually one of the places he starts talking about is the coming of the Lord. And he starts talking about the second coming of Jesus. And he's trying to give them hope for the future. He's trying to help them understand that, hey, listen, one day, all this is going to be gone, but Jesus Christ, he's going to come return. You're going to be forever with him, always being with him for the rest of your life. And one of the things he does is he gives us hope for our future. And when you have hope for the future, you can overcome the stuff that's going on today. And so he begins to give them some various exhortations right before that passage in verse 18. And I want to take a look at that starting in verse 12. And he says, hey, we urge you, brothers... To recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. In other words, while you're going through all this stuff 
There's all kinds of habit going on in your life. God has actually set individuals, mentors, coaches, pastors, maybe your parents, whoever um, speaks into your life. He goes, admonish those. He goes, recognize those who are over you in the Lord because God's gonna use them to encourage you and build you up and strengthen you in hard times in life. Anybody have those kind of folks in your life? I choose and I desire to be one of those in your life as well. He says, be at peace among yourself. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. In other words, in the middle of this persecution, you're going to see individuals that you love, but they're going the wrong way. They're making some bad decisions. And he says, man, warn those. He goes, hey, it's not. He didn't say kill them. He didn't say, you know, take your peace out. He said, then warn them. He goes, man, it's not, it's not, you're not, it's not any good to go back to what you once used to do. Just hold on. Let me strengthen you. Let me be, I'll be in the foxhole with you. It says, warn those who are unruly. <clears throat> Comfort the faint-hearted. There are individuals who will just become weak and will uh, lose heart and they'll be discouraged. And it's up to us to encourage them and build them up. He says, this is family here, okay? He's talking to the body of Christ uh, back then. And that's what, so he's talking to us here. We're, I don't know whether you realize or not, the person sitting next to you, you're gonna, you, you might not like him or her even though you're married to them. But um, they're going to be living with you for a whole long time in eternity. Amen? Amen. So he, he, he goes on to say, he says, man, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold those who are weak. He goes, man, encourage them. They're, you've been weak at times. He goes, lift them up, build them up. He goes, be patient with everyone. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. It says, rejoice always. <laughs> rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Well, how can I do that, Pastor Marcus? Man, I got to work. I got to change diapers. I got to do all this stuff. Well, you can worry without ceasing, can't you? Wow. <laughs> Worrying without ceasing is basically what? Just keeping your mind on all the negative stuff. Well, you can keep your mind on the hope that we have in Christ, on the good things to come. He says, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't quench the spirit. In other words, you're going to have an opportunity to go the exact opposite way. Rather than give thanks, be complaining about everything. He says, don't quench the spirit of God. Because don't despise prophecies. And prophecies is not like prophets that are going to come in and, you know, prophesy to you doom and gloom. Prophesies are individuals who are just speaking words of encouragement to build you up, to strengthen you, to edify you, to, you know, just help your focus and perspective get back on track. He goes, don't despise those, but test all things and hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every evil, every form of evil. Listen, as I said... It's God's will. The gratitude has more to do with an attitude than it has to do with the circumstances you face. The circumstances you face, a lot of times, man, we just can't wait to get out of these circumstances. Like, man, I wish I could just get out of this place, right? The very circumstances that you want to get out of could be, could be, listen, the very circumstances you want to get out of could be the circumstances that God wants to use to change you. I've seen that in my life so many times. So rather than trying to get out of those things and go back around it so that you can learn the lesson, rather than saying, Lord, get me out of this place, why don't you pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to get out of this place? And let him speak and let him minister and let him help you understand. So let's look at uh, gratitude and what, what, how do you define it? Gratitude basically is that word, eucharista. I don't know if that's right, but it sounds like a, a bar, eucharista. It means thankfulness. It's basically for those of us who grew up Catholic, you know, we would take Holy Communion, the Holy Eucharist. And the Holy Eucharist just simply means to give thanks, right? Holy Communion. We're going to be taking communion here in a minute and just give thanks uh, to the Lord. But here's what basically it means. Gratitude is recognizing the positive things that come your way in life that you never worked for, you never asked for, but all of a sudden you begin to recognize them sunset. You didn't ask for it, but it's there. All of a sudden, you're taking pictures while you're driving. <laughs> the sunrise, the birds chirping, 
your grandkids, your wife, your husband, your church, your pastor. (laughs) And it's recognizes those things. Actually, when you think about gratitude, the Latin word is where we get gratis. You know, what does gratis mean? Free. Free. It's unearned. Actually, the word means uh, uh, grace. It's the undeserved, uh, something that you didn't earn yourself. It's a gift that God's given to us. Isn't that beautiful? And there's so many things that we bypass in our lives that we just miss out the opportunity to thank God for, uh, you know, in that moment and in that experience. I remember when I was uh, studying for, um, you know, church and stuff and and I saw the grandkids. I didn't see them. I heard the grandkids, you know, running around the house. This is when they were a whole lot younger. And they were running back and forth. And I'm trying to focus and trying to get studied up and stuff. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you hear a, I'm like, oh, my God. I wish these grandkids would get out of here. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, you're thinking, it's like, man, you want to focus and stuff. You only have so much time and stuff. And then I was like, yes, Sophie, what do you want? And she goes, hey, Popo. And I realized what I thought was an interruption was actually a divine appointment for me to embrace. Because I just want to sit on your lap, Pobo. And I'm like, man, what was I thinking? And so you just welcome that moment. You recognize, see, uh, see, gratitude is stopping and looking at what's taking place right then and there. And then going for just embracing that moment. That's what gratitude is. I saw this video, and it just kind of defines what gratitude is. Draw your attention to the screen real quick. There's something that we know about everyone we meet anywhere in the world, and that is that all of us want to be happy. By experiencing, by becoming aware that every moment is a given moment, as we say. It's a gift. You haven't earned it. You haven't brought it about in any way. You have no way of assuring that there will be another moment given to you. Grateful living, that's the most valuable thing that can ever be given to us. We have to stop. We have to get quiet. And when you stop, then the next thing is to look. You look, you open your eyes, you open your ears, you open your nose, you open all your senses for this wonderful richness that is given to us. Whatever life offers to you in that present moment, if we take this opportunity, go with it. Stop, look, go. That's all. That's all. Stop, look, think about Jesus. He was going down, ministering the gospel, and all of a sudden these kids are running around everywhere. The disciples are getting upset and trying to shoo these kids out of the way. And Jesus stops and he looks. He looks at the attitude of the disciples. Those are trying to get rid of something that was so precious and beautiful right before them. And he says, let that child come to me. And he sits him on his lap. He goes, for such is the kingdom of God. Amen. Giving thanks. Amen. You know, Br- Brene Brown has a quote that says, I don't have to chase extraordinary moments to find happiness. It's right in front of me if I'm paying attention and practicing gratitude. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, I'm thankful for you. Come on, say it with meaning. Say it with meaning. I know you just had a fight when you came in here. Let me give you three thoughts about gratitude, okay? Three thoughts real quick. And this is, this is one of the ways that you can cultivate gratitude in your life. So three things. The first one is this. Whatever you don't turn into praise will turn into pride. 
Whatever you don't turn into praise will turn into pride. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, when there's no variation or shadow of turning. That's who every perfect gift. In other words, what it means is turn everything good in your life into an opportunity to worship. Every good thing is an opportunity to worship. And when we do that, we acknowledge actually the gift giver who is God himself. Amen. I remember when we first came to Christ early on in uh, my early 20s, uh, it just seemed like man, my whole life had changed because I was so in, in a dark place in life and so depressed that I've always had a tendency to look at the things negatively. And when I came to Christ, everything just was filled with joy, just always smiling. People even say like, dude, what's wrong with you? It's like, man, I don't know. There's just like something bubbly going on inside. And so we wanted to go take a trip to uh, Dallas to go see my aunt. And on the way to Dallas, here I am just driving, rejoicing in my new Christian music. And I'm going around. And I looked in my rearview mirror and, and there's some lights going on. I got stopped by a police officer. And I'm like, you know, before it'd be like, oh man, what's wrong with this guy? There's murderers out there. Go stop somebody else. But I'm just like rejoicing. I'm all happy. It's like, oh, look, the police officer, he's going to stop me. And he comes around and... <laughs> And he comes in, he goes, sir, he goes, do you know you were speeding? I said, yes, sir, I, I, you know, I'm guilty. I'm so sorry, sir. He goes, thank you so much for doing your job. I really appreciate you, you taking care of this, you know, this area here and stuff. And he's probably thinking, you know, this guy wants a, you know, this guy wants a warning instead of a ticket or something, right? And so I was just kind of, I wasn't brown nosing him. I was genuinely thankful that he was doing his job. Unlike, anyways, my wife, she, she gets stopped 15 times and gets 15 warnings. Seriously, true story. I get stopped once, brand new Christian, and I'm getting a ticket. And so the guy comes back and he gives me a ticket. And he's like, here, sir, you know, this is the amount of money or whatever. I was like, thank you, sir. He goes, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for doing your job. And I'm just sitting there just rejoicing and thanking God. There's something good to be thankful about that we have people who God has placed in authority to take care of our lives. Crazy people who are speeding like myself, right? And so it's always looking at that, that part of it. Whatever you don't turn into praise turns into pride. Matt Redman has a song called Blessed Be Your Name. And in that uh, song, there's a verse that says, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Yeah. Amen. I'll turn back to a, a, a moment of worship. Here's another passage of scripture in Ecclesiastes, the sixth chapter. And it says this. I don't know if you guys have ever read this one. It says, better what the eye sees than wandering of desire. Better what the eye sees than wondering of a desire. In other words, it's better to have gratitude for what you already have than to claim, uh, complain about the things that you don't have. Better what the eye sees. And you have to have an eye to see that, right? Sometimes our wandering is always for something else, something that we don't have. We're complaining about so-and-so has this, I need to have this. But he says, better what the eye sees than wondering of desire. Do you know that in the Old Testament, there's this uh, commentation, commentator of the uh, Old Testament, it's called the Talmud. In the Talmud, it says it this way. It says, a man embezzles from God when he makes use of this world without uttering a blessing. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yes. A man embezzles from God. In other words, he's saying, if you enjoy something without thanking God for it, it's as if though you've stolen it from him. In other words, anything less than gratitude is grand theft. Isn't that interesting? So there are gifts that are going to come your way even today that we need to just stop and appreciate that and thank God for that moment. And I'm telling you, uh, I've been trying to practice this more and more uh, as I'm studying, but as I'm just living my life, because there's so much negativity in this world, cut the news off. There's always something to complain about. And so it takes discipline in your own life to sit there in the middle of the circumstances that we face, hearing the, the stuff that's happening in other people's lives and rise up above those moments. It's called walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit is living your life still looking for the best, looking for the good that's in that moment and reframing your mind so that you can still have an attitude of gratitude and still look to God in whatever it is that you're facing. Amen. Whatever you don't turn into praise will turn into pride. Number two is your focus determines your reality. Your focus determines, and we all know this, but still, in other words, whatever you choose to give your attention to, 
attracts what shows up in your life. Isn't that the truth? If you're looking for something to complain about, guess what? You're going to find it. If you're looking for something to be grateful about, you'll always find it as well. I remember coming home again. This is early in my walk with Christ. And I would live probably two, three blocks from the church. And um, for whatever reason, I would come home. And I was tired, long day. And I'm thinking, this is, this is the way it's going to be at the house. The kids are going to be doing their homework and all this kind of stuff. The dishes are washed and Natty's got an awesome meal there. And, and well, it wasn't like that all the time. It's never like, it's never been like that. It's unrealistic, right? And so I'd come home and I was like, man, there's the bicycle right in the middle of the, of the front door. I'd walk into the door. There's the socks over here and there's stuff around here. The kids are all laying out. It's like, what's wrong with you? And I would complain about it. And then after a while of doing that, next time I would walk into the door and everybody would go to their rooms. And I'd be like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And it's not them, it's, it's me. And I had to switch. I had to flip that thing. The Lord showed me first 60 seconds. First 60 seconds or so. You see, when I get off of work, it's not that I'm off of work. My work just begins. And he goes, take those first 60 seconds and praise and be thankful for what you do have. So I began to flip that and I could still see the bike there. I'd trip over it sometimes. I would still walk into the doors and there's stuff everywhere. But the first thing I would would choose to do is like look at my girls. Hey girls, I was thinking about you today. Just want you to know daddy loves you. Natalie, I love you. I appreciate you so very much. What are we having for dinner? (laughs) Now you can tell I'm, you know, you can tell I'm I'm starving, right? (laughs) She neglected me very much. <clears throat> but I, you know, actually here, here lately I've been walking, you know, just walking and um, doing this thing. It's practicing gratitude. Uh, one of the things that I do is when I'm walking, I'll take two or three minutes and I've got my music on and stuff. But all it is, is just thanking God for what I do have. Father, I just thank you for the house that I'm living in. Thank you for my neighbors here. I thank you for my wife. Thank you that we've been together for, man, a lot of years since we were kids. I thank you for her beautiful eyes, Lord God. I thank you for her beautiful smile that just encouraged me. I thank you. Well, I don't don't have to say the rest of it. There's stuff that you don't need to know about, but I start thanking God for stuff. (laughs) Thanking God for my kids. Thank you. Thanking God for the neighbor's dog. I mean, just just gratitude. Thank you for this church. And you know, and I sit here and I see your faces. I see Frank. Man, Father, I thank you for Frank that, man, he's been so faithful. He's just, his life has turned around. You've touched his life. I'm thankful for Pete. Man, I remember marrying him over there uh, down in, at Central Park. And this guy looked like a gangster. But look at him now. He's one of our security teams. And just on and on, your faces come to my heart. And I'm just like so thankful that God has given you and I as a, a covenant, a brotherhood, a covenant brotherhood that we can do life together with. And it's just beautiful. Shonda, who's sitting here, and Baba, her husband, and Irene. Irene has been gone. I don't know how many times she keeps coming back. <laughs> And I'm like, man, Lord, what's wrong with her? You know, you you need to stay here. Yes. But just doing that, it's so beautiful. And so um, we can't focus on what we don't have. Now, you guys have done that. Don't laugh at me. You guys ever ever been on a diet? Yes. Or tried to be? And you're focusing. If you focus on what you can't eat, that's what you're going to wind up doing is eating that, right? Lord, I'm not going to focus on Whataburger, but I'm like, forget it now. I'm going to Whataburger. I'm just like, I'll start on Monday. (laughs) The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, your focus determines your reality. Here's what he says. The Apostle Paul in Philippians, the fourth chapter, he says, finally, my brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there's any virtue in those things, Anything praiseworthy, meditate. Think about those things. Think on those things. You know, I was, because we, we have a tendency to get things out of perspective. We, we, go, we go way out of, you know, we take things way out of proportion, don't we? There was a girl who was going in, uh, into college and uh, she was doing well, but this one particular semester, she had a hard time with her classes and she didn't do real well in her, um, in her test. So she needed to, talked to her parents, and rather than talking to them, she wrote a letter to them. And she wrote it in such a way that they might have a better perspective, because she knew that they are going to be upset, but she didn't want them to get so upset and to keep things in proper perspective. So she writes this letter to them. 
And the letter goes something like this. He goes, dear mom and dad, I have so much to tell you because of the fire in my dorm set up by student riots. I experienced temporary lung damage because of the fire and I had to go to the hospital. And while I was there, I fell in love with an orderly and we moved in together and I dropped out of school when I found out that I was pregnant and he got fired because of his drinking. So we're moving to Alaska where we might get married after the birth of our baby, your loving daughter. <laughs> P.S. None of that really happened, but I did flunk my chemistry class and I wanted to keep things in perspective. <laughs> <clears throat> I love that story. But gratitude, joy in your life, it's not about getting what you want. It's about appreciating what you already have. Amen? It's not changing your circumstances. It's changing your focus. And it, I've been praying. My husband hadn't come back. My kids haven't been restored. And so how can I thank God? Well, usually gratitude is something that takes place after the stuff that you've been thinking about happens. But you know what faith is? Faith is next level gratitude. Faith is thanking God before it ever happens. And some of you guys might be in the, in the situation here this morning where it hasn't happened. And you're wondering, I can't have gratitude right now. Yes, you can. By faith. That's next level gratitude. As you're thanking God before it ever happens. And God's going to honor your faith. As a matter of fact, when faith is displayed, Jesus stops. And he says, who touched me? Because he recognizes those who are operating in faith. When you just sit there and you evaluate the whole situation that you're going through in life, there are dreams that you have that haven't come to pass. There are kids that are gone. There are husbands that have left. There are wives that have done crazy stuff that you're just discouraged about. And you want this prayer answered. You want this dream to be fulfilled. And it's not happening right now. You don't see it. How it's going to happen. It's time to stop and look up and start thanking God. Father, it doesn't matter if it ever happens. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to praise you because you've kept me in the palm of your hand. Amen. That's gratitude, my friends. Amen? Yes. Amen. 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 Now, this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to receive communion with you guys. So those three things, just remember how to cultivate. If you want to cultivate gratitude, a lifestyle of gratitude, remember those three things. Whatever you don't turn into praise turns into what? <clears throat> your focus determines your reality. Both services didn't get it. And don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right about God. Practice those things. Remember that. And just you'll start to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. And I'm going to ask Jeremiah to come. And we're going to sing this song called Gratitude, him and uh, Daniel. And we're going to give thanks. We're going to take communion together as a family. Because this is a season that we're all facing challenges in life. We got people coming over and family coming over and you got people that you don't want to come over that are coming over. <laughs> and uh, you're going to learn how to appreciate what's right before you that you wouldn't have appreciated before this message. You've got ants that take all their plates home. <laughs> Man, I remember my aunt. Oh, Lord Jesus. Anyways, you got people like that. You learn how to look at the good in their life and encourage them, build them up, strengthen them, love on them. But the greatest thing that we can give thanks for is that Christ came and he died on the cross for our sins. He's given us forgiveness. Amen. That he's not mad at us. Some of you guys think God's mad at you. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. You're not a disappointment to him. I don't care how bad things have gotten in your life. I don't care what you've ever done in life. I'm telling you, Jesus paid the price to be free so that you can just get to a place where you're no longer living in condemnation and guilt and shame. You could actually just stand up and say, you know what? My God did this for me. And if he did this for me, he can do this for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.